Bank of England Fiverr from 1914. Um, I, I can't hear anybody saying anything, so you know, um, I hope I'll get a message if I'm not getting through or you can't see anything. Yes, we can see it. You're okay, I'm okay, right. Um, so the situation in 1919, there were six banks, Irish banks, and I'm going to show you um, a, um, a selection of their notes very shortly. Um, the only legal tender in Ireland in 1919 um, was, in fact, um, not even a Bank of England note, funnily enough. They were never a legal tender in Ireland, um, but they did circulate there. Um, but was, was this, and this is um, um, a British Treasury note. Um, it had been made legal tender in 1914, and as it says on the front there, um, it's legal tender for the payment of any amount. Now, at this point, I should explain legal tender is a is a very much a legal definition. There's also um, uh, what is more commonly used to describe a lot of the currency that circulates, and that is legal currency. In other words, law the law had permitted the bank to issue that. Uh, uh, its own uh, paper money, and that is what these six banks were doing. But this was the only legal tender in 1919. Uh, now, after Ireland achieved its independence in 1922, albeit at the cost of the island being partitioned between the North, which remained part of the United Kingdom, and the South, which became initially uh, the Irish Free State, these legal tender notes, the, um, the treasury, treasury 10 shillings and pound notes, were in the newly created Irish Free State, no longer uh, legal tender there. So there was no legal tender paper money in the new republic uh, at all. Now, uh, that didn't actually really matter to the people on the streets, the people who used these notes. Um, because basically the, the money, the banks had been, uh, the six banks had been issuing their money now. Well, they, the law hadn't changed since 1845. Everybody was used to using these, uh, the, the notes of these banks and there was no issue about it. Nobody was concerned that suddenly the money would become worthless. Um, they had been very stable, these banks, uh, throughout this uh, long period. And, and even though um, the Irish Free State had been uh, created, there was no issue about that. So these six banks, let me just show you their notes, and I'll just, they, I've picked them out to illustrate one or two wider points. Now, there was six, the first of the six banks was the Bank of Ireland, and the Bank of Ireland is, was always the dominant bank um, in, on the island of Ireland, um, and this is just one of its notes. They issued notes from one pound up to actually 500 pounds, um, one, you never see the top denominations at all. This is a three pound note, which is a very unusual denomination, which you, even at this point, this is a dated 1912, even at this point, these notes were, were dying out in, 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 in sort of uh, regular circulation, but three pound notes were quite convenient in the largely um, agricultural economy of Ireland because three pounds was roughly the price of a pig. So these, these three pound notes would appear at um, local markets and um, you, know, you hand one of these over and uh, you get a decent pig in exchange. So that's why the three pound note existed. But it's always a rare denomination. And in fact, there's only of this particular note, there's only two actual surviving issued notes known. And so they're extremely rare. Um, now, the next bank here is a Belfast banking company. It's obviously based, based in Belfast, but the notes circulate right around Ireland. And this is a £50 note. Now, £50 was a huge denomination in, in, uh, at that time. Um, I would say a £50 note could, it could buy you a decent house in Dublin, in, in, uh, um, or indeed in Belfast uh, at this time. But, uh, and this is another extremely rare note. Uh, so the £50 note, then the third bank was the National Bank of Ireland. This was actually a London-based bank. It had been founded uh, by Daniel O'Connell, who was known as the Liberator, who was actually uh, an Irish politician who had done much to further the 
cause of Irish independence. He founded this bank. He was the first governor of the bank. Um, but nevertheless, it was London based and London registered. Um, but all its branches were in, in, the, in the island of Ireland. And uh, this is a rather nice £10 note uh, from that bank. Um, now, here's another bank, the Northern Bank. Now, the Northern Bank was also based in Belfast. Um, this is a £20 note. Um, extremely rare note, I should say. It's not in very good condition, but as they say in the uh, collecting world, show me a better one. Uh, you won't find a better one because there aren't any others, as far as I know. Um, so £20 again was an enormous sum of money. Uh, this, this would have circulated around Ireland. And one thing that these notes had in common at this period was they all had the branches listed on them. And if you look at that note along the top border and on the lower border, um, it's got the list of all these different towns, <coughs> excuse me, um, around Ireland where the bank had its branches. And legally, they had to list all these branches um, to make sure that the notes were payable in those branches as well as its head office. And the law didn't change till 1920, and then, then the banks were all able to, to drop the notes. Um, now, the next bank is a provincial bank of Ireland. Um, now, this was based initially based in Cork, but um, they were able to move to Dublin after the law changed and allowed banks other than the Bank of Ireland to um, have operating branches in uh, Dublin. So, um, and this, this was payable in Dublin or indeed in any of the branches that were listed there. The Provincial Bank of Ireland was set up in 1825. It was the first of the big joint stock commercial banks and it was, um, most of its shareholders actually were English or Scottish. It was based in London operated entirely in Ireland, um, but um, uh, with operated quote unquote on Scottish lines. So quite a few of the bank managers of the provincial bank had been imported from Scotland to run these branches in Ireland. And uh, quite a lot of their notes have survived. This one I chose because if you can see it on the screen, it's been cut down the middle and uh, rejoined. And this was quite common with um, older Irish notes because um, the postal system as it existed in those days was not terribly secure. There was a certain amount of lawlessness, particularly out in the countryside. So if somebody wanted to send one of these notes um, you know, to settle a business debt or whatever the reason was, uh, they would send the half, half of the note in uh, one envelope, and post it. With, one day and then they would send the other half the next day and then the recipient would join the two halves back up and uh, this was quite common practice and this is just an example of that here and the sixth of the banks was the uh, the Ulster Bank which was also based in Belfast and, um, and as you can see they were quite attractive designs um, the other thing I'd say about these designs is that they had been around a long time when the Northern Bank was founded in 1825, as was the uh, Provincial Bank, the Ulster Bank came a bit later in 1835. But these note designs with relatively few changes were still in use into the 1960s. So, you know, very, very conservative in terms of uh, the designs. Um, but this was a Victorian design. And here it is, uh, this note's dated 1918. Um, you know, it, it doesn't look that different, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to um, its sister earlier notes from you know, the 1850s or, or even earlier. So those are the six banks. Um, they continue to uh, issue their notes as they had done before Ireland became independent or before the Free State had been created. Uh, the notes circulated north and south of the border and nothing really changed. I mean, the backdrop to that is that Ireland, having fought the British to get their independence, uh, the first thing that happened after independence was that there was effectively a civil war. There was a lot, huge amount of civil unrest in Ireland. Uh, basically, the treaty had, that created the Irish Free State had also agreed to the partition of Ireland between the North and the South. And so there was a, a civil war between those who were in favour of that treaty and those who were 
against it because they wanted the whole of Ireland to be independent. Um, that was finally resolved and um, in terms of uh, civil unrest, things did begin to stabilize during the 1920s. Um, now, the next thing that happened was the law changed, uh, the British law that is changed, and um, banks no longer have to list all the branches on. You can see this note, Scott, there's a huge list of branches. They had, this bank had about um, 90 branches, I think, in 1918, so they all had to be listed. Um, the banks were then able to reduce the size of the notes, and they issued new notes. Um, from about 1918, 1919 onwards, the law changed in 1920. And so for a period during the 1920s, everybody had to get used to mostly smaller notes, um, different designs, and um, you know, there was, and again, with, with Bank of England and so on, notes um, occasionally still circulating. So I'm just going to uh, take you through the smaller size notes uh, of the six banks. And as you can see, this is, um, it is a smaller note, it, obviously it fills the screen, but it is it's much smaller than its predecessor. Um, they've introduced color, so there's now two plates. There's a plate that brings, the, uh, the plate that, from which they print the, the black main body of the note, and then there's a, another plate that prints the green section. And each of the denominations of the, uh, the Bank of Ireland had a different colour. So the, the five pound note was red, the 10 pound note was blue, etc. This is quite a scarce note, it's from 1922, so it is dated around the time that um, Ireland became independent. And it's the first of these um, smaller sized uh, notes in two colours. And then the Belfast Bank in, uh, in 19, uh, 22 issued a new series, also smaller sized, and again, it's still pretty much a Victorian design, but quite, a, quite an attractive note, I think. And this is in nice condition, and as you can see, it's still signed by hand. Uh, the, the, the Belfast Bank's notes were all signed by hand, up to and including uh, the last issues in the 1960s. They had a final £100 issue, with a printed signature, but otherwise every single note that this bank issued throughout its life uh, was, was signed by hand. So some poor guys had to spend time signing literally thousands of notes a day. Uh, so, uh, and, the, and this, is, this is one of this chap, Mr. Keith, who signed this note. Um, I estimate that during his working career, he probably signed the better part of a million notes, which is pretty, pretty hard going. And he never, his, his signature, in uh, 1910 still looks pretty much like the signature he was using in, in, in 1930, it didn't really change. And it is, his, it is him who signs and it is his handwriting. It's not, uh, it's not anybody else and it's not stamped on, it's actually a hand signature in old fashioned ink. So the other banks, here's the National Bank. Again, they've moved from uh, two colors. And again, all those colors changed. So the one, the five, the 10, all the denominations were different colors um, and, and quite a handsome note. And this particular example is an extremely rare issued 10 pound note. Um, I can't think of that. There are more than about half a dozen of these notes. And this is probably the one in the best condition of, of the survivors. Uh, Northern Bank, uh, their pound notes, um, not really a change other than reduced in size, um, same format, the same two colors that they used before. Also hand signed this one. Uh, the Provincial Bank, um, this still has the branches on, it's dated 1919. Um, all that happened after they dropped the branches was that the, that, that particular part of the note um, was no longer there. The, the, the note itself didn't change in design or size or anything else but they brought the small size in before they reduced the size, of, before they had to remove the branches. And then finally, here's the Ulster Bank with its pan note, um, smaller sized and in two colors as before. So um, your Irish shopkeeper, if we can imagine somebody, whether he's in Dublin or Belfast or any of the other towns around Ireland, he had to contend with not only the, the the notes of the six banks, and they issued notes from 100 up to 
from, from one pound up to a hundred pounds. Um, uh, they also had to see, you know, they had to deal with the other um, Bank of England or Treasury notes that circulated too. So there was a lot to get used to. Um, and of course, everything changed in 1920 and it will change again um, in 1929. And I'll come to that and I'll show you, because we won't now be talking any more about the commercial banks, um, because we're going to move on to what the Irish Free State decided to do once uh, the state had um, established itself and was up and running. Because the first thing that they wanted to do was to have their own currency, to show that they're independent, to issue notes that, that were very much uh, portraying Irish themes and to show that you know, an independent country should have its own currency. So they formed a currency commission and then they started, they set up a, a, a committees to decide what their new notes should look like, um, how they should be funded, and whether or not the link with sterling, because every, all of these are in pound sterling, uh, whether that should continue and in what shape or form, and also what to do in the free state with the six banks who were still issuing all the notes. So they had a lot of thinking to do about that. And their conclusions were that they would issue um, an Irish legal tender note. Um, that would be their own currency. It would be fully backed by sterling. They decided that they would keep the Irish pound and the British pound at one to one. And so when they finally come to issue these notes, there was a lot of debate internally about exactly what the wording should be on the note. But the wording that they finally chose was, that, uh, was to reflect the fact that there was absolutely, there should be no doubt in anybody's mind that a new legal tender Irish note would be worth one pound sterling. Sterling at that time was, you know, one of the, well, was the global currency probably, uh, although the dollar was, um, you know, about to shove it aside. But um, it was, you know, it wasn't just the British currency, it was the currency of a lot of uh, places around the British Empire. So, this is what they started to do. I found this in the archives of uh, what is now the Central Bank of Ireland. Um, it's obviously um, handwritten. And um, this is the first attempt at wording um, of um, the free the, uh, the legal tender note. The, you can see at this stage, they hadn't decided what they were going to do by way of um, you know, a vignette or any other um, imaging on the note. And they hadn't actually decided on the text because this was not the text that was adopted. It says here it's secured, one pound legal tender, secured by assets in possession of the Currency Commission, redeemable um, uh, in sterling at the Bank of England. That's not quite the final wording, but um, the, the intent is clear enough there. Now, the next thing that they had to think about was, well, what about this? You know, they had to work on the design of the note, and they had to work on the wording. So that was up in the air. This was produced in 1927, this note, and the debate continued through 1927 and into 1928. And um, here's, here's another version of the, um, the text. The, the text is slightly different here, but again, it isn't what was finally adopted. Now, um, before they made their final decision, they looked at who might print these notes and they um, invited tenders from the three big British printing, security printing firms of the time. And the three were Thomas de la Rue, who is the, the big surviving one that you see still producing masses of notes around the world. Bradbury Wilkinson, which was actually owned by the American Banknote Company, but was operated as a British company based in London. And the third one was Waterloo and Sons. Now, this, what you're seeing here, is a probably unique um, photograph, actually, of the proposal submitted by Bradbury Wilkinson. They didn't win the contract. Bradbury um, didn't print any notes for the, um, the Irish government. Uh, but nevertheless, they submitted this. And this is, the text is in Irish. Um, and this was the front of the note. Uh, it depicts Thomas More, who was a, um, a 
I'm going to tell you exactly who Thomas More was. Just bear with me one second. Um, and he was he was an Irish um, uh, he was an Irish poet, singer, and songwriter. So um, that was their proposal. They also presented an English side to the same note. So all the text here is in English. You can see it's dated the 1st of January 1928, which is pretty much the time when they submitted this thing. There's a lovely Irish scene there. The, uh, that's um, hand sketched, by the way, what looks like the watermark there. That's a depiction of Erin which Erin being the, the, um, the, the mythical queen of Ireland and the female depiction of Ireland. That note was not selected. They also produced a pound note. Um, and this one here, the central part of it, uh, those are symbols taken from the Book of Kells, which was an early Irish religious text of incredible beauty, which you can find in, the, in Trinity College in Dublin today. And to the left is Henry Grattan, who was um, a famous politician um, who opposed the um, dissolution of the Irish Parliament in um, 1802 and uh, was very much a nationalist, supporter of the nationalist cause. But let's say this wasn't adopted. And here's the English side of it with a, with a view of uh, Glendalough, which is a particularly beautiful part of Ireland in uh, County Wicklow, south of Dublin. Um, but these, these are unique examples of the notes that were not selected. What was selected, and um, here it is, was this, uh, the Lady Lavery notes. Um, and that's a story in itself. I mean, I could probably do an entire lecture on how Lady Lavery came to be on the Irish banknotes. She was born in Chicago. She was an American. Uh, she married an Irish painter who'd actually been born in Belfast, not in... Uh, obviously now still part of the United Kingdom. Um, and she had, going back several generations, Irish ancestry. But she, uh, being the wife and a particularly, um, and a beauty of the day, apparently, um, the artist, her husband, Sir John Lavery, was approached to, um, to come up with a, a portrait of a typical Irish Colleen. And, um, and so he agreed to do this portrait. He was paid 200 guineas, which is uh, quite a lot of money, even in those days. And um, he came up with this portrait. It was accepted by the Currency Commission, although I think everybody knew from the, the outset this was actually his wife. But um, it got approved. She ended up on the banknotes. And so from 1928, you can see this note's dated the first date of the issue of the, the legal tender notes. Uh, you had 10 shillings, pounds, fivers, tens, twenties, fifties, and hundreds, all of them with the Lady Lavery portrait. Um, and this was the new Irish currency. Now here, I'll just go back a slide. This is the uh, close-up. And as you can see, it's a 20 pound note, this one, or an extract from it, 20 pounds sterling, payable to the bearer on demand in London. So the new Irish currency, was payable in London. And that text remained on their notes until uh, the, the 1960s when they finally dropped it. But every Irish legal tender note was fully backed by sterling, which was basically held by the, uh, the Bank of England. So we have the 10 bobs, and I'm going to run through these. Um, here's a 20 pound note, which has a slightly bigger portrait, which is closer in size and, and, and scope to the the real thing. She's leaning, um, got her elbow leaning on the, uh, the Irish harp, which you don't see on the, the, the smaller note. Um, these are classics. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously biased here, but I think these, these Lady Lavery notes are absolutely wonderful. Um, they were printed, designed and printed, by the way, by Waterloo, who got the contract for them in 1928, um, and only lost the contract uh, because they were taken over by Delarue. Um, so there's a 20. Now, I, I felt I had to show this particular note. It's a 50 pound note, it's a specimen. But if you look to the right of the note, um, just to the right of where the printed signatures are, you'll see two hand signatures. This note has actually been autographed by John Lavery, the artist, 
and Hazel Lavery, Lady Lavery herself, as the um, person in the portrait. And they signed this note and gave it as a gift to Winston Churchill. And um, he um, passed it on to his um, chauffeur and his chauffeur's descendants finally um, handed it over to an auction house in London a few years ago where I was able to acquire it. And it's one of, it's, it was one of the star notes in my collection. Not only is it a beautiful note, but it's also got that wonderful uh, provenance and you know, direct connection back to the Lambrys themselves. So I'm, I'm, you know, I just think it's a delightful, delightful um, item. So moving on, this is just the front of the note. On the back, and um, those of you who know the Irish series will, will know what these uh, symbols are in the middle of the note, but that is one of the, uh, the river gods. Now, um, there were a lot of river gods, there were 14 of them altogether, and they were over the curved arches of the windows of the, the Dublin Custom House. And if you do go to Dublin, you see the Custom House, a beautiful 18th century building. You can see all these sculptures still in situ. And this one, as um, the caption says, is, uh, depicts the, the River Blackwater and the particular fish that you get in that river, as you can see in his, sort of, um, in his hair. And he's got a basket of fruit on top of his head. Uh, that's because there are a lot of orchards that um, uh, are watered by the waters of the River Blackwater. So that's the 10 bob note. And then we have the pound note on the left is the, uh, uh, the river god, the, the River Lee. And then on the right is the River Lagan. Um, uh, there's a certain amount of um, political um, consideration here because one or two of the rivers that they chose were actually in what is the north of Ireland in, in, in Ulster and not in the, the Irish Free State at all but nevertheless um, Irish rivers and here's the 10 and here's the 20, 20 on the right, um, he's the River Boyne. Now the River Boyne, the sculpture on the side of the Dublin Custom House, you can see he's got a headband there that headband on the side of the custom house has got the date 1690, which is the date of the Battle of the Boyne, which pretty much um, cemented um, British domination of um, Ireland. It was uh, William the Orange's forces, uh, William of Orange, who was the, the King of England, but had originally come from, from, from Holland. Um, and they defeated the, the Irish um, opposing armies um, of the Battle of the Boyne. Uh, still celebrated, um, I have to say, um, every year in Northern Ireland, but obviously not in the Republic. And here's the 50 and the 100. Um, again, wonderful, wonderful uh, depictions of these river masks. Um, and the, the one on the right is the River Urn, which actually flows through several lakes, which are wonderful fishing territory for those of you who enjoy your fishing. And um, the river mask shows you you know, a fair depiction of the, the range of fish that you can find on the river. So moving on, what happened to those commercial banks? Well, the, um, the government in the Free State decided that um, there was a lot of lobbying going on because the six banks made a lot of money out of issuing their own notes. And so there was a, a compromise agreed, which I think is unique to Ireland, whereby the Currency Commission would allow them to continue to issue the notes. Um, they would be payable by the Currency Commission. The, the, the banks would have to deposit money with the Currency Commission to make sure that there was backing for the notes. And um, there was, a, again, a debate over the text to go on them and a debate over which bank should be um, involved in this uh, arrangement and um, a debate over the the design of the notes themselves. And this is a, obviously um, drawn by hand, the first effort uh, to, to put some text on the page. Uh, somebody who did this um, didn't use his spell check. Um, I'll leave you to spot the missing letter on one of the words there. Um, if you haven't spotted it yet, um, anybody who has ever been to Ireland will know how they should actually um, write it, spell it. Um, right, now this is how the 
decided on the designs. These were prepared by um, a, an Irish artist. And um, will you bear with me another second? I can tell you who the Irish artist uh, was. Well, maybe I can't because I've forgotten to write it down. But um, an Irish artist created these designs and the top uh, panel there is a ploughman with his two horses. And that was chosen as the design. Um, and the contract for these notes, the like so-called ploughman notes, of course, because of ploughman, the, the contract was won by Thomas de la Rue, who had originally been pitching to get the, uh, the legal tender contract as well, which was much more lucrative because far more notes were involved. Nevertheless, they got this business and they created the classic ploughman design um, based on that, uh, the panel of uh, that note at the top there. Um, it was, oh, here we go, it was Dermot O'Brien, who was the president of the Royal Hibernian Academy. So an established, well-known artist um, who produced these uh, sketches and um, the, the plowmen were chosen. And, and here's a closer up so you can see um, the design of the two horses. Um, it was actually switched round. When you get to see the note, you'll see it's the other way around. Uh, horses on the left and the plowman on the right. Um, the, there was a lot of debate, actually, about the precise design. And these notes were first issued, and here's the date here, 6th of May, 1929. And I'll talk a little bit more about that date in a moment. Um, that was the first date that these notes were issued. Um, the artist was involved in the correspondence, all of which has survived in the archives of uh, Thomas de la Rue themselves. Um, and so we, you know, we've learned an awful lot about the genesis of these notes. The artist was really unhappy about the way the horses had been depicted. Um, now, uh, it's not particularly evident from that note, which incidentally is the rarest of all the pound notes of this series. It's a Northern Bank uh, design and um, is uh, of the 17 different signature varieties on the, these, bank, these notes. That is by far the, the most difficult to find. Um, here's the fiver and um, here's the tenor, um, also a very rare note, this particular one. Um, now here's a close up of the horses. What the artist said was, well, it's two horses, there should be eight legs. Now I can't count eight legs there because some of them are obscured by the other, you know, by the, the way the design is, is, is created. And he wrote several letters complaining about how his original horses had not been properly depicted on the note. Nevertheless, this was signed off in the end and the notes were issued. Um, and incidentally, there weren't six different banks. Uh, there were eight different banks that issued plowman notes. Um, of the original six, one of them dropped out, the Belfast Bank, because uh, they, were, they had got rid of all their branches. They'd sold off all their branches in the, the, the free state. Um, and so three Dublin-based banks who had previously not issued notes um, were invited to join this scheme. So they issued notes the first and indeed the only time in their uh, lives. And so the three extra banks um, were the, uh, the Munster and Leinster Bank, Hibernian Bank and the Royal Bank of Ireland. And, um, and so you've got um, eight banks issuing plowman notes, you've got uh, six denominations, although the 20s, 50s and 100s um, one frankly never sees uh, because they were all, uh, those very few that were issued were all withdrawn. Um, but you've still got quite a range to collect because some of the banks used more than one signature. Um, I think the Pro Provincial Bank of Ireland, just as one example, had three different signatures in the 10 years that these notes were being issued. Uh, and if you want to collect these notes by signature variety, you're going to have to get 43 notes. Um, I've been collecting now for well over 30 years. I've only got 42 out of the 43. Um, the final one is, uh, I know, available in the hands of a dealer, but um, I, I suspect I probably have to sell my house to be able to buy it. So I don't think I'm going to end up with the full set. But they're wonderful notes, very widely collected, beautiful designs, 
and uh, you know lots and lots of different minor varieties for those of you who, who like to go into the real detail of the notes. And they had a common design on the front, but on the back, these notes had um, beautiful different views of buildings or um, uh, locations in Ireland. This is the custom house in Dublin, whose uh, uh, river heads were on the, um, uh, the legal tender notes. It's a fabulous building, it's still there. Um, you know, the only thing that's changed about that view is the, uh, is the type of ships that you see in the, in the, in the river Liffey in front, of the, uh, in front of the building. And here's a fiver, this is a view of Cork. Uh, this is a view of uh, Foster Place, which is right adjacent to the Bank of Ireland's uh, main office in College Green, uh, a lovely classical um, 18th century building and uh, another beautiful design and you see all the ornamentation that goes around the, the central vignette. Um, the 20 pound here, that is the, the Rock of Cashel. Uh, it's a ruined cathedral. It's one of the most beautiful spots in Ireland. And uh, you know, it's a pretty beautiful depiction of that site. Uh, and this is um, Croak Patrick, which is a, a, a mountain in the northwest of Ireland which is um, a site of annual pilgrimage where the, the truly devout climb up the mountain to the very top. Um, those of them who are the most devout of all go up on their hands and knees as a, an act of additional devotion. Um, so it's a very famous mountain and, and once a year the, pil the pilgrims um, head there. And then finally, this is Killiney Bay, which is south of Dublin. And this is a view before they uh, started to uh, build houses on it. But it's a beautiful view. Um, and this is south of Dublin, looking towards the, the Wicklow, uh, the mountains of Wicklow. So they're all classic designs, beautiful notes. And uh, yeah, it's a delight to be able to look at them. Um, so I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm delighted to have the opportunity to show you all these things because I don't get to see them that often myself. So it's uh, you know pretty nice, pretty enjoyable. Now um, the sixth of May, 1929, was an important date because after a lot of uh, negotiations between the banks and the Irish Currency Commission and the, the authorities in, in in London, the Bank of England and the, the Treasury. It was decided that on the 6th of May 1929, the Irish, the six Irish commercial banks would be um, allowed to issue in the north. They get a new license issued in Belfast only for circulation only in Northern Ireland. Um, they would have the, uh, the Plowman note uh, scheme in the, um, the south. So you had um, eight banks, as I said, in the south issuing Plowman notes. And the six banks continued with these new issues in the north. And, um, and so that, you know, eight plus six is 14. Um, you add in the uh, Lady Lavery notes, uh, that's 15. And okay, there were still Bank of England and Treasury notes circulating. So that makes a grand total of 17 different types of note that uh, were circulating in Ireland to a greater or lesser extent, which must have been one hell of a nightmare for the shopkeepers and the bank tellers and the like. Now, I mentioned the 6th of May, 1929. Um, if you take a close look at this note, you'll see that the Bank of Ireland jumped the gun very slightly. This note is dated the 5th of May. The 5th of May was a Sunday. When they realized they'd made a mistake, the Bank of Ireland of all the banks was the only one they printed their own notes. They had a big printing department in College Green um, and they got the date wrong. So somebody had to go through and put one in front of the five to make the notes technically legal. And, and they did the same with the tenor. The tenor was the 4th of May in the initial print run um, and that was um, a Saturday. So as you can see, those dates were amended to the 14th and the 15th and somebody had to go through. He had we reckon with the, uh, uh, the five pound note, he um, probably had to hand stamp something like 60,000 notes. Uh, with the tether, it was even worse because they spotted the mistake a bit earlier on. So he probably had over, over 80,000 notes. Somebody had to go through and stamp the one on 
to, to get the, the notes um, acceptable to the authorities. I don't suppose that anybody who used these notes in circulation ever really focused on the date or would have cared whether it was the 4th or the 14th, but uh, that's not the point. The law had to be observed. So that was the Bank of Ireland. Uh, the Belfast Bank continued with the series that had started issuing back in 1922 anyway. Uh, the National Bank issued new notes in the north. The National Bank in the north of Ireland um, had very few branches. Most of its branches were in the south and in the west. And so they didn't have much of, uh, you know, the, 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 the numbers of notes that they actually issued in the north was very much restricted. And, um, and, and consequently, this first 1929 issue of the National Bank, these notes are very, very scarce. We do see the pound notes occasionally. Five pound notes are much rarer, the 10 pound notes are even rarer. And uh, the 20 pound notes, well, <laughs> um, they issued 2,500 of them. Um, according to the records, we found only 12 of those are still outstanding. And of those 12, only two are known to have survived. Uh, one was on eBay not so long ago. Uh, the chap who owned it was asking for a huge sum of money, and I think he still owns it. But there's only two of them, so sooner or later it will change hands. That's the National Bank. The Northern Bank used some of its old stock and overprinted earlier notes. You can see this one's still got the branches listed, but they, they overprinted them. That was okay for the authorities, and so uh, the, their first notes had these um, overprints on them. Provincial Bank of Ireland, so here's the, the 1929 20 pound note. It was a new design fairly similar to the old one, but it was still a new design. And, um, you know, quite attractive, but also pretty scarce. Um, I think that they, this particular design was issued from 1929 to 1944. In all those years, they only printed and issued 8,000 notes. Uh, so it's you know, a tiny print run. So, you know, people who collect Irish notes are um, going to have to be very patient if they want to build up even a, a type collection, never mind one that includes different signature and other varieties. Um, and then finally, the Ulster Bank. And it's pretty much the same design that they were using before. It says over the vignette, Northern Ireland issue. Uh, and uh, the serial numbers are in red rather than black, which is what they were before, but otherwise it's, it's an identical design, uh, payable obviously only in Belfast, not payable in Dublin as they were back in the 1920s. And um, there we are. So the, the six banks um, continue to issue in the north. They gradually reduced down to four. The, the Belfast Bank was taken over by the Northern Bank in 1970. Um, the uh, National Bank was taken over by the Bank of Ireland in 1966, so the six became four. And then more recently, um, now that we're, um, the, the, the issue is in Northern Ireland, uh, the four of them were uh, decided that they would also follow the suit of the Bank of England and switch to polymer notes, which involves quite a bit of expense. The uh, successor bank of the Provincial Bank of Ireland, uh, now known as the First Trust Bank in Northern Ireland, decided that they would give up their license. It was the first bank in Ireland to give up its banking license voluntarily uh, since the 1820s. So you know, it's quite a, a momentous step. Uh, and it means now there are only three issuers of notes in Northern Ireland rather than the previous four. Um, and it's possible that um, as we go further into the future, that, that three might even reduce further because the economy of Northern Ireland is not as big as Scotland, for example, where there are three banks. You know, the total number of notes in circulation in Northern Ireland issued by the local banks is much smaller. Um, the profit margins are correspondingly small, and there will come a point where they might have to decide what the first trust bank decided, that there's not sufficient profit to continue it. So the future is not completely um, untroubled, I would say, for, for um, Northern Ireland banknotes. So basically get them while you can. Now I've been um, 
so it has been suggested to me that I should leave time for questions, and I think there's up to 10 minutes for questions. I haven't received any yet, I don't believe, or have I? No, not aware of any questions. Um, but if you have questions, this is your opportunity. I'm very happy to answer any of the questions or what I've been telling you. Um, I should mention, by the way, that um, all of these notes that I've been showing you, all of these images, or nearly all of them, will be featuring in the book that I'm working on called Paper Money of Ireland. It's the second edition. Uh, we're updating what we um, first published um, 11 years ago. Uh, a lot of new information has come to light, and that book will, I hope, be out uh, next year. Um, so if, you, you know, if you're not a collector of Irish notes, that's the book you'll have to have if you haven't got the first edition already. Um, so, um, any questions, please? I'm not getting any questions at the moment. Oh, hang on. Sorry, I've just got the chat page here. Um, yes, <laughs> Ireland was misspelled. Thank you, Pam. Yes, good spot there. But I think I did give it away. Um, and somebody has asked, has the Irish pound kept pace with the English? Well, the, the, they diverged. Um, until 1979, the Irish pound and the British pound were kept apart, one to one. Um, in 1979, they diverged the Irish pound. They decided to join um, the European monetary system, which was um, a precursor at that time to what is now the euro. And so the two currencies began to float separately. And there was a time when the Irish pound was worth a lot less than the British pound, and there was another time when it was worth a lot more. But Ireland, has, in 2001, entered the euro, uh, joined the euro. Um, currency and so they gave up their own net bank notes and um, uh, and that was and so you know that that uh, no longer applies you can still if you've got old Irish bank notes and you don't want to keep them in a collection and they're not worth anything in numismatic terms you know the poor condition you can take them to the central bank in Dublin and you'll get the equivalent in euros for them they, they will be they will do that for the um, Irish legal tender notes uh, and probably the plowman though I, I think Pretty much any plan is going to be worth a hell of a lot more than its face value. But your scruffy old Irish notes, if you've got any, take them to the central bank in Dublin and you'll get nice, fresh, new euros for them. Um, another question. With the politics in Ireland, did banks ever refuse payment for defaced notes? Well, that's a good question. Um, technically, they probably could have done. Um, certainly, uh, mutilated notes, um, they might have paid out subject to making sure that there wasn't another part of the same mutilated note that would be uh, um, paid in somewhere else. Um, I, to be honest, I'm not aware of any cases where they, they refused payment because even if it had been defaced, it's still written on it, promised to pay the bearer on demand, and they, the banks, to my knowledge, never uh, refuse to honour um, any genuine notes as submitted. It's a different matter with um, uh, forgeries, obviously, but no, I don't believe that happened. Yeah, with all the politics, there were quite a few defaced notes, and there were certainly defaced coins as well, um, where various uh, political factions um, stamped their little messages on the, the coins and the banknotes. Um, but I'm not aware of any of them ever having been uh, refused. And is there, oh, somebody's asked me, is there a notes I'm still seeking for my collection? Yes, um, I mentioned the plowman note that I need to complete my plowman set. So if you've got a nice spare note, 10 pound note, um, um, issued by the Northern Bank, so it's a Northern Bank plowman, 10 pound note, um, you can call me and I will uh, be very, very happy to talk to you about it. But I'm very surprised if I hear of any, um, because they're very, very rare notes. Um, now, I've got some more questions here. Um, when are the polymer notes coming out? Well, in Northern Ireland, the three banks that are issuing polymer, they've already issued the £5 and the £10 notes. They were all issued 
last year, same time, three banks issued them same time in February of last year. So the fives and the tens are already circulating and the 20 pound polymer uh, is maybe out uh, next month. Um, they haven't fixed a date yet, it may be delayed. Uh, with the, uh, the, the coronavirus uh, crisis that we're in the middle of at the moment, um, people are suddenly far less keen on using cash. Uh, and so there's probably no great rush to get the new 20 pound notes out. But they've all been printed, they're ready to roll. So I imagine they'll be out to join the fives and the tens uh, pretty soon. Um, now somebody's asked a question about national bank notes often found with pen marks on the watermark of, yes, well, I'm afraid the Northern Ireland issues of the, of the national bank, they had a great big space for the watermark. And I have a theory that the, uh, the tellers in the, uh, the National Bank were actually trained to do all their um, mathematical calculations by writing them on the note. And it is quite difficult to find them without the, uh, the uh, uh, graffiti on. Um, there are, they do exist, and I don't think I... Uh, well, the, the 10 pound note that I showed you um, was free of graffiti. Uh, and you can find them uh, without graffiti, but you, you have to be patient, I'm afraid. Um, right, I have just seen another question. No, I don't think I've got any more questions. I've got four minutes to go if you want any more. If you have any more questions on um, Irish notes. Um, oh, yeah, one more. Did I say that the government will still redeem old Irish pound notes? Yes, is the answer. Legal tender notes issued by the Irish government, by the, uh, uh, the Currency Commission or the Central Bank of Ireland, pound notes up to £100. Yes, take them into the Central Bank in Dublin and you'll get euros for them. Yeah, that will, and that will, that, there's no end to that promise. I mean, they've been uh, um, demonetised, but they, they will keep the promise to pay them, they'll be taken back in. Oh, and somebody asks, when's the new book coming out? Well, it'll be next year. The publisher is uh, Pam West, um, and um, she's um, very politely drumming her fingers, but I think we're getting through it. I've done, I've done over half of the book now. Um, a lot of it's, in fact, most of the rest of it is, is, is nearly complete. So I'm pretty sure it'll be out uh, in the first half of next year, possibly even the first quarter of next year, but I won't promise because that would be dangerous. <laughs> There's always a chance of delays with these things. Um, somebody says here, I have a watermark screen of the Erin watermark with LTN Jason. Yes, that's right. Well, the Erin watermark was on all of the uh, Lady Lavery notes. When they were finally replaced, the watermark Lady Lavery became the watermark on the subsequent issues. So even up to 2001, the, uh, um, the watermark was either Lady Lavery. So she, was a, she appeared actually in either watermark or printed form on every single Irish government note. Um, yeah, somebody says here they have a watermark screen. That's, that's a nice thing to have actually. Erin um, herself, by the way, the... Um, Having said that Lady Lavery is uh, an American on an Irish banknote, Erin the, uh, was, the watermark was based on a sculpture by um, an Italian artist, sorry, an Irish artist of his Italian wife. So the watermark is basically um, an Italian woman posing as Erin and the image is of a typical Irish Colleen is um, an American woman. But, um, Nobody in Ireland ever seemed to worry about that. Um, is it possible to get uncirculated Northern Irish notes from the issuing banks direct? Yes, in theory it is, but it's quite difficult. You basically have to go to Northern Ireland and uh, charm one of the tellers into giving you new notes. It's not, you know, you, you could write to them and ask, but they probably won't, I mean, they might reply to your letter, but they probably won't send you any in the post anymore. They've, uh, 
they've become ultra security conscious uh, in, in recent years and that's affected a bit the availability of these notes so I can't promise you any way to get a new Irish note unless you go to Northern Ireland and get one or you go to a, a good dealer who, who, who um, will have them on offer. Um, I, I'm afraid that that might be all of the time that we have for uh, Mr. Callaway. Thank you so much for that, your talk. Um, that, my pleasure. I've enjoyed speaking to you all. I'm glad I got plenty of questions. Um, if you've still got questions and you haven't had the answers, then, you know, um, my email address is in the um, IBNS journal. So drop me a line. I'd be very, very happy to help you. And, and thank you all for listening.